Today we're going to take a look at how to get started using Node-RED on a SmartStorm 341. Uh, a quick note about what I've got on my setup here. I've got a SmartStorm 341 connected via Ethernet to my PC. On the SmartStorm 341, I'm connected to ETH0, which is set up to be uh, a DHCP server. So it's providing the IP address to my PC. I don't need any other connection, just a hardwired Ethernet. And then what you can actually see on the screen is I've got a web browser open. Uh, I'm using Chrome, but obviously you can use your preferred variety. Uh, and I've got a couple of tabs open. Uh, the first of those uh, is pointing to address 192.168.1.1. And that's the default address of the 341 gateway when you connect it onto ETH0. Um, and pulls up what we call the local embedded web server. That's a, a a web server that sits in the 341 that gives you access to some maintenance and configuration parameters. The second tab I've got open up here, which we'll come on to in a bit, is the Node-RED Editor tab. Um, but the first thing you're going to need to do if you uh, are taking your 341 out of the box is you're actually going to have to enable access into Node-RED. Um, as, as a security measure, we by default disable access um, once you've got access to Node-RED, although you can't crash the gateway uh, because Node-RED runs in a protected container, uh, you can obviously get access to data and start manipulating, manipulating data. And so from a security standpoint, we take the view that it's better for it to be turned off by default, uh, and then you make your conscious choice to access it. So to turn it on, uh, what I'm going to do is log into the embedded web server. Uh, if you've got a SmartWorks Hub account, I can, you can do this from SmartWorks Hub as well. There'll be other videos talking about SmartWorks Hub and how to do stuff from there. So for the moment, let's assume you're just going to do it from the local embedded web server, which is probably the way you are going to do it if you've got this out of the box for the first time. So I've logged into the embedded web server. I've got a number of options available to me. The only one that we're interested in for the purpose of this video is the one over on the, no, on the right hand side called Node-RED and specifically the Node-RED firewall. Now when you do this, you're going to see a blank entry here. I've got stuff here because I've already used this gateway to do things with Node-RED. I've already got some other Node-RED running. So I've physically gone along and, and opened up some ports to allow those to, those to operate. You're going to see a blank window here and all you need to do is come along to port and add port 1880, uh, which is the default port for Node-RED. So literally, you'll just type in 1880 here and press save. And that will create an entry that will look like this first one in the table. And having done that, you've now enabled Node-RED. What that means is that you can come along now uh, and open a page at 192.168.1.1 colon 1880. That's the port number we've just opened. Uh, and that will give you access to the Node-RED editor. Uh, and you should see a page that looks something like this. It won't have these two tabs. Um, because those are existing tabs in my system. So you should just see something that has a single flow node on it. Uh, and this is the environment that we're going to use to create our user applications. Um, and we'll go through that in a second. The, the first thing I'll do is I'll just give you a quick tour around what you're seeing in front of you. So down the, the left hand side here is, is a palette of available nodes. And these are the things that you're going to use to create your data flow uh, that you're going to use to modify data as it comes in and capture data. Uh, and you do that simply by picking nodes and, and dragging them onto the screen and dropping them down. In the middle section here, there is uh, a, the actual editing area. This is where you drop nodes, where you do the configuration. And then over on the right hand side, we've got some things that, that give us information on what nodes do. So as I go along and click on nodes, I get information that might tell me um, what different configuration uh, options give me or, or what I need to do. So general information about the nodes. Uh, dashboard, we won't worry about at the moment. We'll cover that in a, in a later video. Uh, but the debug page uh, tab. Uh, and this is important because this is where you can investigate in real time what your flow is doing, what data you're getting. So um, let's actually create a flow. The first thing I'd suggest that you always get into the habit of doing, uh, and I'm going to do it here, I don't need it for what I'm showing you, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's good practice, is 
when you're creating flows, quite often you'll find there's a need to do something just the first time you run through. You might want to initialize some variables, set some starting conditions, or, or capture a time of restart or something. So there's a process that you just want to do once the first time you execute. And it's good practice to just always give yourself the ability to do that. Uh, and the way you do that is you pull down an inject node, um, and I would say you pull down a function node. Uh, you'll see I've just dragged those and dropped them on, and I'm going to wire those together basically by picking the, uh, the little knobs on the end of them and, and wiring between them. That's a, a click, hold, drag, the release. Um, I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it initialization. Uh, but I'm not actually going to put anything in there. It's not going to do anything. Uh, I've just reserved the ability to add stuff in the future if I want to for initialization as I go through a flow. So now what happens is, you know, I, I open this up and I need to put some configuration in. I need to tell it that I want to inject it automatically on startup, but I don't then want to do any repetition. You'll see here I've got the ability to repeat at intervals or at a specific time or whatever. Uh, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to fire once when we start up and then finish. Uh, and I can choose what information I'm going to pass out of it. For the purposes of what we're doing here, it doesn't really matter because all I'm doing is creating a trigger that says later code executes and executes once. So I'm happy to leave that at timestamp. I've ticked inject once at start. I hit done. And that's created something that basically the first time node red executes, this will fire. It'll kick uh, an input here, and that will kick any code that I choose to put in here or downstream to actually execute. I'm not using that today. Uh, it's just good practice to get into the habit of doing. What we're going to do today for our flow is we're going to pull some information in from connected wizard devices and just demonstrate that we can see that information live on the debug screen. So nothing too uh, complicated. The way we do it is, again, we drag and drop nodes. So I need a wizard node that I can pull down. Uh, and I'm going to connect that through to what we call a debug node, uh, which is a way that I can essentially say I want to look at information in this section here. So some things to notice about the environment. You'll see each of these nodes has a blue dot above it. Uh, that means that that's changed uh, on the screen, but it hasn't yet been deployed down to the physical device. So I'm making changes here. We're not updating the flows in real time on the SmartSwarm 341. We actually have to go through a process of deploying our change to fire it down there and make it active. Uh, the other thing you'll see here is a red triangle. That signifies that this node has some configuration missing that is needed for it to run at all. And, and so that's something that you've got to address uh, before you deploy a, a flow. Uh, the other thing I'll show you just down here are some zoom buttons that are useful. If you start to get big flows, you can essentially scale the page to whatever you want, or by hitting the circle in the middle, just pull it back to its, its normal 100% view. OK. So let's address this configuration issue. Um, this is pulling information in from wizard devices. I've already uh, used this, so I've already got my port set up at localhost 1883. But what you're going to see here is something that says add new wizard broker, assuming this is the first time you've got it out of the box. And what you're going to do is you're going to hit this pencil. And that's going to bring up a screen that looks like this. It's going to have 1883 in this port number. That's the default port that Wizard connects on. You should never need to change it. And certainly within the scope of this video, we don't need to discuss why that might change. So all you're going to do is click a button here that in your case will say add. Uh, and in my case says update because uh, I've already got that definition. I'm actually going to cancel. Um, and what you'll see when you've hit that add button is you'll see this local host 1883 appears in the port. The other thing we need to know, do, though, is we need to tell the node what information we're interested in, in seeing from our wizard units. Uh, wizards publish information using the MQTT protocol. Uh, there's a document on the website that, that tells you about all of the payload structures and, and uh, topic space formats. What I'm going to do for the moment is say I'm interested in absolutely anything. And the way I do that in here is I use an MQTT wildcard, which is the, the hash symbol. And that basically says uh, match anything from this level in the hierarchy or down. 
and because I'm putting that as the very first thing in the hierarchy, that's basically going to show me anything that's coming in on that MQTT configuration or, or from the wizards. So I hit done. You'll notice now that my red triangles disappeared. I've got a configuration in, in this node now that is happy and, and is capable of running. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fire that down to the gateway by hitting deploy. And as soon as I do that, uh, you'll see here that I get uh, information telling me that's gone down. And immediately now, I'm getting information is appearing in this window from this debug node. And I know it's this particular debug node because as I hover over any of these, you'll see that the, uh, the outside of the node has this dotted red line on it. And if I had multiple debug nodes capturing information from different sources, essentially I'd be able to see which one of them was providing the information. So looking at the data I've got here, you'll see I've got a number of things. I've got uh, MQTT topics that are coming in, and then I've got MQTT payloads. And they're coming in from a variety of different sensors. You'll see some different numbers down here. Uh, as we go through things, um, and they're providing information on different topics. So I've got a CFG slash SIS, CFG slash sensor, uh, and so on. Now, in our real world, um, we're probably not interested in seeing all of this information all of the time for the flows. What we're probably interested in is actually just the real-time data that's coming off of the wizards. Uh, and that gets published on something called BB slash node ID slash data as a topic. So if I didn't want to see absolutely everything, I just wanted to see the data that was coming through as, as data, then the way I do that is I come back to this node and I change my subscription. So I'm going to change this now to BB. I'm going to use a different MQTT wildcard. I'm going to use the plus sign. And that means match anything in this field. Um, but then I can go into put data. So now that's going to say if I have a topic that matches BB, I don't care what this is, but then matches data, then I want to pass that down this wire to my pay, to my debug node. But anything else that doesn't match that, for example, this AM slash mode slash whatever it may be, won't get passed down. Okay, so having done that, I'm going to deploy it. So it goes down to the gateway and I'm going to clear this space so we just see what's coming through now. And what we're going to see now is none of that stuff that was around the configuration or around the dust radio. We're just seeing data packets. Um, a quick note on this. Obviously, you could have a whole load of different wizard subscriptions, each subscribing to slightly different data, um, and do your filtering that way of things of interest. The problem with that is every time you drop one of these down onto the, uh, onto the page, it's actually consuming some resource. It's creating a connection that it's maintaining. So it's better in general terms to keep these subscriptions as general as possible. So something like I've got here now where I'm just looking at data and excluding everything else. And then do the filtering in node red code downstream of it because that's a much better use of resources. Anyway, that's uh, opened up uh, node red for editing. We've created a flow and we've shown how you can get debug information and see in real time what's actually happening on your system. Uh, come back for more videos on what you might want to do next.